Consider the power God has packed into the tiny package we call a seed. If you plant a seed in the soil, God has placed some amazingly complicated instructions inside of that miraculous package that rearranges the soil into a plant that forms the food we eat and the mighty trees we use to build homes. Yes, even the massive oak trees we use to build some of the finest furniture we access every day and the cabinets in many kitchens began life as a tiny acorn that found its way into the soil. Then God watered the soil, warmed it with sunlight, and waited as the information he placed inside the seed organized the building blocks he placed in the dirt until a giant tree was formed. Then the beautiful tree that God formed from the blueprints contained within that tiny acorn became a home for the birds, which God made in a very similar way to that tree. You see, the birds, the squirrels, and the insects that God made to live in the tree all come from genetic seeds, just like the oak they live in. God first made all things without any seeds by miraculously speaking them into existence just as Genesis describes. But then, God placed inside all living things the ability to reproduce after their kind through the power of the seed. And we can think of a seed as being like a tiny but vast library of recipes that records all that God said to organize the matter he created into every individual kind of living organism within his creation, including plants. So after God made the very first type of living organism by speaking them into existence, from the day that they were created until this very day, every living organism of all of the kinds God ordained reproduces through what the Bible calls a seed. God gave plants the ability to reproduce when their seeds come into direct contact with the dirt. But God formed many of the remaining living organisms out of the dirt and created a different way for their seeds to be planted and to bring forth offspring. About this, Genesis chapter 4 records, Now Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Every biological descendant of Adam and Eve has been born to a father and a mother just as Cain and Abel were, and seed planting, biological conception, and birth are how God gives each of us physical life and brings us into the world. But just like the oak tree, ever since creation, physical life begins with the planting of a seed. Meanwhile, we should mention here that in modern terms, some people use the word spore instead of the word seed to describe how a few of the amazing plants God made reproduce. But many ancient sources record that spores were considered seeds until relatively recently and the writers of the Bible would have agreed with that conclusion. We can easily prove this fact by looking up Strong's number G4703 in a biblical concordance, because the Greek word sporos that bears that particular Strong's number is the origin of the word spore in modern terminology, but it was used in the Bible to refer to seeds and the sowing of seeds. Yes, even Jesus used the Greek word we transliterate into English as spore when he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how, for the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. 
But when the grain ripens, immediately the man puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. Here Jesus is describing grains like wheat while using the Greek equivalent of our English word spore. So biblically speaking, spores are just seeds by another name. And this is even confirmed by our Lord. But Jesus makes the miraculous power of the seed clear in his comparison of the kingdom of God to seeds that produce grain step by step until the crop is ripe and ready for the harvest. And Matthew, while using the other Greek word for seed, which is sperma, Jesus explained, the field is the world, the harvest is the end of the age, and the desirable grain represents those who hear the word of God and do it. They will be gathered together to inherit the kingdom of God at the time of the harvest. Meanwhile, our teacher once more used the linguistic origin of the word spore in his most famous parable about seeds. He said, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground. They sprang up and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. A parable is an easy-to-understand comparison between some universally understandable story or sequence of events and some more difficult-to-understand principle or concept. So the easy-to-understand portion of what we know as the parable of the soils has to do with how four different soils responded to the sower's seed. But Jesus also told his disciples what the seed and the soils represent. He said, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear, then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, who believe for a while, and in a time of temptation, or also translatable testing, they fall away. Now, the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep the word and bear fruit with patience. Every descendant of Adam and Eve eventually falls into one of these four categories depending on how they respond to the seed which is the word of God. But only the fourth soil is unbeaten by the schemes of the devil. And Peter wrote about the seed, We have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. The Holy Scriptures are the seed that can bring spiritual life, but we must receive the seed, 
allow the seed to take root deep within our hearts and lives. Guard the life that the seed brings by consistently pulling out the weeds of life that choke out the plant the word produced. And allow the seed to bear good fruit, the fruit of obedience to God. To avoid becoming the first soil, we must realize that many pseudo-saviors are being presented in this world by many false prophets and false teachers. And those deceptive messages can snatch the life-giving seed of the Word of God away from our hearts. Some false teachers proclaim a Savior that is not concerned when people practice sin. They lie and teach that all their pseudo-Savior cares about is what you believe. But to those who accept this lie, someday Jesus will say to them, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Other false teachers declare that their false Messiah abolished God's commandments. And they claim the commandments no longer apply to the Lord's disciples in the New Covenant. But to warn people against this terrible lie, the real Messiah explained, if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Other false prophets and false teachers preach pagan gods, atheism, humanism, or countless other lies that lead people away from the life-giving seed of the Word of God. And Jesus compares all of these false prophets and false teachers to birds in the parable of the soils. In other comparisons, when Jesus likens his followers to sheep, he calls the false prophets and false teachers wolves. But in both examples, the point Jesus is making is that those who contradict, twist, or lead us away from the Holy Bible are inspired by Satan, and they are extremely dangerous because they keep the seed from implanting and bearing good fruit in our lives. For this reason, the Bible warns us about false prophets and false teachers more than it warns about nearly any other danger. Plus, the Bible explains that false prophets and false teachers are a problem that will only get worse as history unfolds. Yes, friends, Paul explained, evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So there are more seed-snatching birds in the world today than there have ever been in all of biblical history. And we must understand that even Bible teachers can be like seed-snatching birds when they teach that parts of the Bible are not to be obeyed. As we have established, only the foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances of the Levitical priesthood have been set aside by God. But all of the rest of God's commandments still apply to all of God's people, including God's Sabbaths and his feasts. Now for all people who avoid being taken captive by devilish deception, the next danger they face is not allowing the word to take root deep into their hearts. This type of person represented by the rocky soil receives and believes the message of the Bible and even experiences a time of growth as God's word brings a tender young plant to life. However, this type of person does not prioritize the study of God's Word, and they refuse to add knowledge to their faith and virtue. They get tired of hearing the same passages of the Bible that God first used to originally create spiritual life in them, and they fail to prioritize time in the Word 
time in prayer, and time with the people of God. So, because they neglected the seed that is always working within those who read the Bible to reorganize our hearts into the image of the Savior, when an inevitable time of testing eventually arrives, this type of person departs from the faith and returns to their old, dead ways of thinking. The third soil represents the person who received the seed of God's word and allowed it to take root deep in their hearts. But they also allowed evil seeds sown by the devil to grow up like weeds at the same time. Many people don't realize that just as God's word is like a seed, the messages and ideas swirling all around us in this world are also like seeds. Every movie, every book, every TV program, every idea, and every concept contains information that can either strengthen us in Christ or create weeds in our heart. Yes, just as God's Word contains the blueprint for how we can become fruit-bearing plants made in the image of our Creator, Satan has filled the world with evil information that works like seeds that grow weeds in our hearts. Only God's Word can create and grow the type of plant and the Christ-like fruit that God desires. And all other ideas that contradict God's word are like evil weed seeds that threaten to choke out the fruit of a disciple of Jesus Christ. The carnal world around us is obsessed with outward appearance, selfishness, wealth, pleasure, security, comfort, immodesty, fame, and many other temporal fleshly things. And these ideas keep them from bearing the good fruits that Jesus desires. So this is why John the Apostle warned us, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Instead, friends, we are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and God is not of this world. Therefore, the principles of God that we are called to pursue should be things like righteousness, faithfulness, peacefulness, holiness, gentleness, kindness, humility, perseverance, and self-control. Please ask yourself, when is the last time you considered how you could be more righteous, faithful, holy, humble, or Christ-like? When is the last time you considered how your life could be more pleasing to your Father in heaven? This is what the spiritually minded person is most concerned with. Now ask yourself, when is the last time you considered your earthly financial problems? sought after your own earthly pleasure, or were anxious about some earthly aspect of your life. This is what the fleshly, carnal-minded person is most concerned with. Paul warned, those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to be fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And all of this is true because the fleshly mind is God's enemy. It's at enmity against God. For the fleshly mind is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. The weeds of the third soil represent fleshly thinking. 
So can you see how easily the worldly weeds spring up in our hearts and take over? We so easily forget God and His will as we accept living among the weeds as part of our everyday experience. But our Lord told us never to think in those ways. He said, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. He said, Woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. He said, Do not worry about your life. And he taught us to live to please our Father in heaven rather than to live for personal selfish pleasure here on earth. So we can and should deal with all of the issues of life with God's will, God's word, and God's pleasure as our top priority. Then, God will direct our paths and eliminate the weeds of fleshly thinking from our hearts and lives. But it is easy to see the weeds that represent the cares, riches, and pleasures people concern themselves with in this life should not exist in the heart of a true disciple of Jesus. So Paul writes, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more. He's talking about bearing more and more fruit. Just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. For you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Many people who claim to be Christians live to please themselves. They pursue earthly goals, earthly gain, and earthly priorities. But true Christians who are spiritually minded seek to please God in all that they do instead of living to please themselves. The fleshly-minded person who lives to please themselves might still believe that God exists, and they might even still consider the Bible the Word of God. But they read the Bible in selfish, fleshly ways that center around what God can do for them. Meanwhile, Scripture warns about this soil type that consistently puts forth weeds for the soil which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated, receives blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So the third soil type that God has invested the seed, the rain, the sunlight in, that soil type that just brings forth weeds and no mature fruit, is headed for hell, just as the first and second soil types will be cast into the fire. But on the other hand, those who are spiritually minded, who live to please their Creator, they view the Bible very differently. They search the scriptures to discover what pleases God so they can do those things. Also, when they learn what displeases God, they ask their Lord to help them remove the weeds from their heart. And these folks crucify the desires of their flesh as they die daily to sin. Both types of people represented by the third and fourth soil types read their Bible, but only one type reads it so that they can obey all that the Word teaches as they allow the seed to transform them into the image of Jesus their Lord. So, the type of spiritually minded person who receives the Word of God and obeys all that it teaches by submitting their will to God's will 
can be compared to good soil that will allow the seed to bear good fruit in their lives. The first type of person never believes the word of God, so they remain dead in trespasses and sins, devoid of all real spiritual life. The second type of person believes the word for a time, but refuses to commit sufficient amounts of their time or energies to grow spiritually. So in their spiritual immaturity and apathy, caused by their neglecting of our great salvation, they depart from the faith in a time of testing. The third type of person believes the word of God and even grows in their faith to a point. But by refusing to think about the things of this world in the way that the Bible commands us to think of these things, they allow other competitive, weed-like seeds to grow and thrive in their heart. The fleshly-minded values, priorities, perceptions, and doctrines of the world around us are far more dangerous than most of us realize. So far, most of us can recognize the perils of the LGBT movement. And so far, we seem to be able to spot the hazards of abortion. But how many of us see the threats presented by churches that teach against the fourth commandment and profane God's Sabbath every week? Friends, all three sins I just mentioned are death penalty offenses in the Bible. But we have been programmed by thousands of years of satanic deception not to think that profaning the Sabbath, violating the fourth commandment of God, is evil. Meanwhile, in Scripture, it is plainly written for all to read, What evil thing is this that you do, by which you profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do thus? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and this city? This is speaking of the 70 years of captivity of Israel and the destruction of the temple of God. So Nehemiah says, Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. Please understand, when Satan fails to stop a person from believing the word of God, or when Satan fails to distract a person from growing in their faith by digging into the Word of God, Satan's next line of attack is to keep the person from believing, applying, and obeying certain key parts of the Word of God. Yes, if the devil can't stop you from reading and believing the Bible, the devil will try to convince you that it is permissible to treat the Word of God like it's a buffet. And the devil has secretly ensnared so many souls with this deception that it has actually become the hallmark of most modern theologies. So we must think about money the way all God's Word teaches us to think about money. We must think about the Holy Sabbath God created in the beginning, the way all of God's Word teaches us to think about that Sabbath. And we must think about every other aspect of life in the way that all of God's Word teaches us to think about every aspect of life. If not, will end up fleshly minded and we will not submit to the will of God. Now, the best way to recognize the difference between the third soil and the fourth is to look at the fruit people bear. Jesus said every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. If someone claims to be a disciple of Jesus, but their fruits don't match their faith, you can recognize them by their fruits, not what they claim to believe. 
But fruit is also a metaphor, just as the seed in the parable was a metaphor for the word of God. So at this point, we need to explain what Jesus meant when he taught, by their fruits you will know them. When John the Baptist preached to the people, he taught, Therefore produce fruits worthy of repentance. And when Paul taught the people, he said, Repent and turn to God and do works worthy of repentance. So by comparing these two passages and exchanging the word that precedes the phrase worthy of repentance, we confirm that fruit is a metaphor for works. And this is confirmed by Paul, who wrote to Titus, his protege, let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. So, through many other passages, we see good works are fruits worthy of repentance. And repentance means that we agree with God's commandments that teach the whole world that sin is wrong, and we should stop sinning. Therefore, good works that are worthy of repentance are works that demonstrate we believe and obey God's commandments. Thus, we can recognize the difference between the third soil and the fourth soil by watching to see if someone is keeping the commandments of God or if they are violating them. This is why John wrote, Now by this we know that we know God, if we keep his commandments. The person who says, I know God, but does not keep God's commandments, is a liar, and the truth isn't in him. Weeds, like false teaching, fleshly concerns, or selfishness, might choke out the fruit of a Christian and cause them not to bear good fruit, such as the keeping of God's Sabbath. And John tells us this means such a person does not yet know God. Meanwhile, many people who claim to know God don't keep his fourth commandment. So how do we reconcile that fact with John's inspired declaration? Well, the answer is, when Satan tricks people into treating the Bible like a buffet, he also tricks them into believing in a God that does not exist. This is what Jesus was warning about when he said, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. This man is dressed as a woman, with makeup and a wig, while standing behind a pulpit in a church. Please compare the Jesus he must believe in to the real Jesus of the Bible. Because Jesus and the Father have always been one, it was Jesus who told Moses, A woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all who do so, are an abomination to the Lord your God. But because this man has disregarded that passage, Satan has tricked him into exchanging the Jesus of the Bible for a different Jesus. Then the man put on a dress, painted his face with makeup, placed a wig on his head, and entered the pulpit of a church to mislead a congregation including little children. But please consider what verse of the Bible other than Deuteronomy 22.5 specifically prohibits such behavior. The fact is, friends, only one passage of God's Word specifically forbids such conduct. So, if we can all tell that such activity is wrong, and it is, how much more wicked is it to disregard dozens of passages that declare working on the Sabbath is evil and worthy of death? You see, culture is having 
in many cases, more influence on the church than the seed of the Word of God. And the fact is, there are many more weeds and man-made messiahs in this world than most Christians realize. And because third-soil Christianity has become so popular in the world, Jesus warned, Many, not a few, many, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. But Jesus prophesies, and this will come to pass. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. If anyone says they know him and does not keep his commandments, they are a liar, and the truth is not in them. So to avoid hearing that terrifying sentence and ending up in hell for eternity, we must receive the seed of God's word to have any spiritual life at all develop within us. And that spiritual life is represented by that plant. Then we must read and study and obey all of the Bible to let the seed grow and thrive and root deep within us. Next, we must die daily to the weed-like cares, pleasures, riches, deceptions, and fleshly thinking of this fallen world to live the rest of our days as servants of God instead of ourselves. And if we take these three simple steps, the living and active seed of the Word of God will bear good fruit in our lives, transforming us into the image of our Creator as we obey all aspects of the will of our Father in heaven in all things. Now in closing, there is another seed mentioned in Scripture that is just as necessary as the biblical seed itself. And this seed was first mentioned in Genesis chapter 3. There God told Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. This prophecy predicted that one day one of Eve's descendants would have a son, and her son would bruise Satan's head. But in the act of inflicting that decisive deadly blow to the serpent, his heel would be bruised. And later Abraham was informed that he would be permitted to be part of the lineage of that son when God told him, in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Meanwhile, Paul later explained, Now to Abraham and his seed, singular, were the promises made. Paul points out, God did not say, and to seeds with an S, as of many, but as of one. And to your seed, God said. And Paul points out that seed is Christ. So, friends, Jesus is the seed of the woman and the seed of Abraham. But David also received the promise that assured him he would be part of the genealogy of the seed. God said to David, When your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. And about that prophecy, Paul wrote, Jesus Christ our Lord was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. 
So, just as you and I need the seed of the Word of God to have spiritual life, the Bible always leads us to repent and believe in Jesus. He is the seed of the woman who defeated our adversary, the devil. He is the seed of Abraham who died to offer the blessings of Abraham to the people of all nations. And he is the seed of David who is coming back to rule on the throne of his father forever and ever. And the Son of God, who became the ultimate seed, has said to us, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, the Father takes away. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears fruit much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch, and is withered, and they gather them, and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. So you will become my disciples. The very first message of the Bible that we must believe is that all who sin are condemned to the fires of hell for eternity. But Jesus died and rose again so that all who will repent and turn from their sins can be forgiven and have their sins washed away. When we believe that message, we are baptized to symbolize that we are dying to sin to live the rest of our lives as disciples of Jesus. And on that day, we cease to be the first to soil. But we must abide in Jesus, and his words must abide in us. And we must spend time with the Lord in his word and in prayer to allow the seed of his word to transform us into his glorious image. We must obey all of his word, not just the parts that we prefer, as we watch out for the weeds of the wicked one. And if we hold fast to Jesus and allow his word to abide within us through trials and temptations and tribulations, we will bear fruits worthy of repentance and prove we are truly his disciples. And we'll know the joy of our Lord on Judgment Day.